Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for coming out to, uh, to the National Security College today uh, to listen to uh, us talking about one of the hottest issues in town, Brexit. Um, when, it, uh, when this occurred, I'm sure uh, that it was a shock to my colleagues just as much as it was to, uh, to pretty much everybody that Britain would actually vote to leave the European Union. Um, and uh, as a result, we had to perform some fairly fast footwork to ensure that we were able to, uh, to have enough people to say something about uh, Brexit uh, and also to uh, ensure that we had a reasonable crowd. Uh, and by goodness, a uh, really reasonable crowd uh, to help with our discussions today. And that's what I want us to focus on, in fact, uh, in this event. You'll find that the presentations will be relatively short. Uh, and we want to open the floor to uh, discussion as much as possible. Uh, so let me uh, formally welcome you to the National Security College. Those of you who don't know very much about the NSC, uh, I can give you a brief backgrounder. The NSC is a partnership between the Australian Government uh, and the Australian National University, and our mandate is to uh, build bridges between the academic uh, and the policy community. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I'm sure we have our usual propaganda available uh, on the back table. Uh, anyone who would like to, uh, to know more about the college, please go and see Chris down the back and I'm sure he can help you out. Uh, but uh, today we're building a different kind of bridge. Uh, we're building a bridge with uh, one of our good partners uh, at ANU, the Centre for European Studies, uh, which does excellent, excellent work on an area which in Australia, uh, I think is fair to say, does not receive enough attention. And it's at times like this, when something dramatic happens in European politics, uh, that, uh, that uh, ANU's Centre for European uh, Studies gets, uh, gets turned to. And I think Anne-Marie Elijah, who will be uh, addressing us today, has been especially busy since last Friday. So we're very lucky to have some of her time. So uh, I think what I might do is, is give you some just preliminary uh, observations before we get to the actual format of today's discussions. Um, first of all, it's fair to say that obviously the dust has yet to settle uh, on what is going to be the wash up of Britain's decision to leave the EU. And on the one hand, those of you who've been following this in the press will have seen that there are many, many gloomy predictions uh, about ruin, not just for the United Kingdom, but ruin for the European Union as well. Uh, you also see uh, those who will say that the EU will be just fine uh, and that it's the UK that will suffer and a whole array of pundits and political scientists, many of them much better uh, than me, uh, doing what they do best. And political scientists generally at this time and pundits as well uh, tend to express either shock and horror or smugness. And they say, I predicted this all along. Uh, the, uh, the nails in the coffin of the European Union are just starting to be hammered in. And this has long been predicted. Uh, we're not here today, I think, to do that. Uh, we're not here to engage in point scoring. And we're not here to make confident long-term predictions uh, about the wash-up of the Brexit. Um, nor are we really here to give anything close to uh, what we would say as the you know, definitive word uh, on what happens in the aftermath of Brexit, uh, mainly because all of us would agree, I think, that it's far too soon to do that, and to, do, to attempt to do so would be precipitate. So what we are here to do, though, uh, is to offer some fairly tentative observations, uh, but observations about a few key issues. Number one, what are some of the political implications of Brexit for the European project in general? Uh, whether it's European institutions, the process of European integration, the nature of democracy within the European Union. Um, these are all things that we will probably touch on in presentations and uh, more than happy to discuss when it comes to, uh, to, to the group conversation. Second, uh, one of the things we'll be addressing, or at least I'll be addressing, uh, is uh, what are some of the security implications, if in fact there are any, and some would say there are no security implications really, uh, of Britain leaving the EU? Uh, and thirdly, what are some of the normative issues related to things like fear, and things like uncertainty that might shed some light on our own politics uh, and politics elsewhere in the West, particularly, I think, uh, the United States, with, uh, with uh, the election looming there? Does Brexit 
can give us, uh, or should we take from Brexit, the notion that uh, perhaps Trump uh, is someone who, uh, who will be strengthened uh, by this decision. Uh, so to address these questions today, uh, we have two excellent speakers and one mediocre one. Um, the, the, uh, the two excellent speakers, the first one is uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Anne -Marie, uh, Elijah, uh, who uh, I did my PhD with at the same time at the University of, uh, of Melbourne, so it's really good to reunite with Anne-Marie. Uh, she's Associate Director uh, of the ANU Centre for European Studies. Previously, she's worked for PMNC as a Policy Officer, and she's taught politics at a, a wide array of places, University of Melbourne, Victoria University Wellington, uh, and also ANU. And uh, her research focuses very much uh, on uh, British uh, policy uh, and uh, its role within the European community, the role within the EU, uh, and also EU-Australian relations. And in 2014 to 2015, uh, she held the Europe-Australia Business Council Fellowship here at ANU. So she is very well qualified to speak about this topic today. Uh, the other excellent speaker we have is uh, Dr. Adam Henschke, my colleague from the National Security College. Um, now, he focuses on ethics uh, and uh, norms and identity, uh, with a particular focus on applied ethics, also touches, in, uh, touches on cybersecurity, just war. Um, he had his, received his PhD through the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at Charles Sturt, uh, and has uh, two master's degrees, Two master's degrees or three? Only two. Only two. Oh, right, okay. I thought he was collecting more than just two. Um, two master's degrees uh, in applied ethics, one from the Norwegian University of Technology uh, and a master of bioethics uh, from uh, Monash. Uh, generally, the, uh, well, what we'll do in terms of the format is that I will uh, invite Anne-Marie uh, to speak first um, and then I'll speak by way of introduction to me. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Matthew Sussex and I'm the academic director here at the National Security College, uh, and I focus on general security issues, uh, but with a primary focus on Russian foreign and security policy. And uh, in the past, for my sins, uh, I have also um, dabbled quite a bit in European security affairs. So uh, I'll ask Anne-Marie to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes or so, uh, and then I will have a go for about the same amount of time, uh, and then Dr. Henschke, and we will take questions after that from the floor. So without any further ado, let me welcome Amory to the podium. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Matt, thank you very much for that introduction. And may I begin by acknowledging the work of the National Security College and particularly Matt for bringing us together for today's conversation. Uh, not yet a week after the referendum vote. So very well done, Matt. Uh, as Matt has said, this is a co-hosted event uh, between the National Security College and the ANU Centre for European Studies, uh, which is an outfit slightly further down the road that is jointly funded by ANU and the European Union itself. Uh, we're delighted to be part of this collaboration and we're delighted for European Studies to have suddenly achieved this profile, although perhaps not in this fashion. So it's, it's my task this afternoon to provide some introductory and introductory remarks and some context for our conversation and to give some political background. In the brief time that I have, I want to outline some of what we know and some of what we don't know and uh, to make three very brief points. So in the referendum last Friday, as you will know, with a turnout of 72%, the British public voted to leave the EU, 52 to 48 per cent, and with a simple majority of more than a million votes. The full ramifications of these events will not be clear for months and perhaps for years. And as Matt has already said, the dust is very much yet to settle. This vote followed a highly divisive campaign, and the result has left the United Kingdom more divided, arguably, than ever geographically, economically, and politically. Prime Minister David Cameron promptly resigned. Both major political parties are now in turmoil. This uncertainty, perhaps we could even call it chaos, since Friday's vote can in part be attributed to the way that the referendum took place. And this was something largely unfamiliar to Australians, I think because people in the United Kingdom were being asked to vote on one option that was clear 
that is to remain in the United Kingdom on the terms renegotiated by Prime Minister Cameron and announced in February of this year. And on the other hand, there was the possibility to vote for leaving and what that option entailed was not remotely clear. So it's in that position that we now find ourselves. Political elites both in the United Kingdom and in the European Union clearly did not expect a leave vote and seemed to regard even entertaining this idea ahead of the vote as only encouraging the Brexiteers. On reflection, I think this was a misjudgment of public sentiment and the latest unfortunate example of the gap that exists between the leaders of the EU institutions, their member state governments and the public who cannot seem to identify with the European project. In the short term, this failure obviously means we have ongoing uncertainty until there is a new prime minister in Britain and that prime minister makes clear his or her intentions. We are not going to know exactly what this outcome means or what the British Parliament will decide to do. The geographical split makes the situation worse. Scotland, Northern Ireland and Gibraltar, with majority votes for Remain, have signalled their separate intentions to remain part of the European Union. Within a few days of last week's vote, Westminster was petitioned for a further referendum. So we can say with certainty that Britain is divided over the EU, but little else about where UK policy may go from here. This brings me to my first point. Clearly, this is not the end of the matter. And I just invite people to reflect for a moment on the history that has brought us uh, to this particular place. And if we take history as our guide, uh, this cannot, in fact, be surprising. The British were debating in and out for all of the 1960s, for half of the 1970s as well. The 1975 referendum on then European community membership did not settle the issue, in spite of a two to one vote in favour of membership. Deep divisions over Europe have persisted in British political parties. Friday's vote did not put an end to these or solve the question of Europe once and for all for the Brits. Second, the vote for Brexit leaves the process of European integration exposed to domestic politics and perhaps to Euroscepticism in a new way. Now, referenda have been used by member states in different ways in relation to the EU for some time. It is not a new development for voters in EU member states to voice their concerns at the ballot box and for this to have an impact on the shape or the pace of European integration. So to take one example, the French no vote in 2005 stopped the pro proposed constitutional treaty in its tracks. But in the 40 odd referenda so far put to the European public at different times, most of these votes have been about more or less integration. So for example, does a given country wish to adopt the Euro? Does a given country wish to adopt a new treaty? There is the case of Norway, where the prospect of EU membership has twice been voted down at referendum. But these are not the same as the 23 June British decision. This was not about more or less integration. This was about in or out. It was not a vote in a prospective member state but a member state which has participated in the European integration process for more than 40 years. Now, there was a good deal of controversy in the early 1990s around the proposed Treaty of Maastricht, also called the Treaty on European Union, and this period is often associated with what we call the end of the permissive consensus about the European project, the idea being that by and large, until then, the European public had left the business of regional integration to political elites. So in the early 1990s and arguably through into the early 2000s, this consensus, um, many analysts conclude, has ended. But the Brexit vote signals, signals something else entirely, perhaps another phase in citizen engagement with the European project. Its ramifications are not yet clear, but they are serious. 
Third, I want to dispense with the notion that Brexit could somehow be simple. Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union sets out, very briefly as it happens, the mechanism for a member state to leave the European Union. There are really two tasks here. The first is working out how the UK would leave, and the second is sorting out the arrangements for UK-EU relations afterwards. As we know, there are already great differences of opinion over when Article 50 should be invoked. And the intricacies of this extraction process will start to become clear in the years of negotiation ahead. But we can already see that various models are being put forward as possibilities for the UK. The Norwegian model, the Swiss model, the Turkish model, perhaps a straight bilateral trade agreement. These may have some relevance, but the models put forward were never based on a member state of some four decades departing the EU. The likely outcome is none of the above. The European Union is an advanced case of economic integration and policy coordination across 28 member states. In the context of the campaign that we just witnessed, it was clear that the full extent of integration was being overlooked in some quarters, perhaps deliberately in some cases, and in others through a lack of understanding about what the European Union actually is and does. The UK extricating itself from the EU involves the UK departure from the key EU institutions, the Parliament, the European Council, the Council of Ministers, the European Court of Justice, the European External Action Service. I could go on and on. And then there's all of the committees and processes attached to these institutions. Some of this movement, as we've seen, is already occurring. Jonathan Hill, the British Commissioner for Financial Services, resigned almost immediately. But this is not going to be fast or smooth, and it means that across a huge range of policy areas where competences have been ceded to the EU or where they are shared between London and Brussels, that British policy making will now work differently. This potentially impacts everything from the single market to climate policy, development aid, migration, transport, police cooperation, you name it. Let's be clear that this is a major overhaul of how the British government and public policy making works. Internationally, the British government needs to extract itself from more than 50 bilateral trade agreements, return to representing itself at the WTO, and perhaps open negotiations with key partners to retain access already achieved through EU agreements. The European Union's foreign policy clout has never matched its presence in trade policy. However, the United Kingdom potentially loses long-term institutionalised cooperation in this area too. And the EU, on the other hand, loses a key member state. Earlier this week, in spite of all the events of last week, European Union High Representative Federica Mogherini released the EU's new global strategy. It's called Shared Vision, Common Action, A Stronger Europe. But nobody is under the illusion that what happened last Friday can somehow be put to one side. Releasing the strategy, High Representative Mogherini noted that it was clear we would have to rethink the way our union works. From the perspective of a third country such as Australia, it is quite clear that Brexit will not be simple. It will absorb time, energy and resources in both Europe and the UK, and attracting Europe's attention will be harder than ever. In summary then, following the Brexit vote, we are in uncharted territory. Friday's vote is clearly not the end of the matter in British politics. The vote very likely signals a new phase in the engagement of the European public with the European project, and it is not clear how that will end. And there is nothing straightforward about the negotiations for leaving, for the UK, for the EU itself, and for third countries who take an interest. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. Um, I should pick up, I think, on, uh, on something uh, Anne-Marie said that was quite important about uh, the uh, articles for leaving 
the European Union, Article 50 of the Treaty of European Union being so brief, mainly because people never really countenanced a country wanting to, to leave the European Union. It was all about enlargement and getting bigger. Uh, it was assumed very much that countries would continue to want uh, membership in the EU, not that they would question their membership in the first place. Let me rewind history a little bit uh, to quickly talk about uh, the origins, well, not the origins, the formation of the European Union in 1992, ever since it emerged from the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Europe, or the EU project, has faced a kind of dilemma. Uh, and that dilemma is, should it widen physically, uh, or should it deepen? Should it pay more attention to its uh, developing uh, integration within its own set of institutions, within its membership base? Now, I don't want to labour this point at all because, of course, the EU has tried to do both simultaneously. Uh, but I'd also suggest that it's fair to say that, in practice, the EU has focused on expansion. Why did it do so? Well, of course, it was deemed necessary uh, at the time to encourage former communist states uh, after the Cold War to join. Uh, and that enthusiasm for physical enlargement of the European Union uh, also kind of created its own momentum. Uh, so that beyond the initial Visegrad states, uh, it then became a sort of imperative to enlarge further and further and further. So you have an EU that goes from a relatively small core to uh, a very pan-European EU. What did that do? Well, uh, it created a lot of benefits, especially to people who lived in those former communist countries. Uh, it created benefits in trade, created benefits in service delivery, created obviously benefits in terms of free movement of people. And that's all very well. That works fine when times are good. Uh, but of course, even when times are good, something that we I don't think we've recognised enough is that it has created... Uh, some degree of resentment as well, whether that resentment is legitimate uh, or not, um, amongst particularly what we might say are the more powerful EU nations. What else did the choice to enlarge do? Well, uh, on the negative side again, I think it has created a simmering perception of illegitimacy in terms of where political power in the EU is actually derived from. We can understand that, I think, by looking at some of the popular critiques uh, of its, its many institutions. Uh, the European Parliament was seen for many years as little more than a rubber, rubber stamp without a real agenda. Uh, and hence, it's become something of, and this is a cartoonish version, so I hope you forgive me, uh, but hence it became a kind of dumping ground for publics to elect parties of protest. A convenient way to lodge a vote against the EU was to vote for UKIP, for instance, in European parliamentary elections. Now, of course, those of us who focus on democratic politics and democratic theory would also say that the EU itself is a bit of an oddity. It has a parliament that doesn't really legislate. It has a bureaucracy that doesn't really promulgate. And it's got a council that enacts and proposes simultaneously. Uh, this is very, very unusual when it comes to, to looking at democratic polities. And I think it's there that we can see some of the origins of resentment of the EU. Now, in the case of the Brexit, there are, of course, also local factors. Um, and uh, it's, it's very good to see some of uh, our, our colleagues and friends from European embassies and, of course, the British High Commission as well um, in the audience. Um, but there are local factors. Britain has struggled with the idea of so-called Europeanness for some time. It styled itself very much as with but not of Europe. There were numerous jokes made about uh, the continent as opposed to Great Britain, you know, such as, you know, fog over channel, Europe isolated, a uh, very popular um, British, uh, British chuckle. Um, and that, I think, never really went away in British politics. Uh, and it was also clear from the Brexit vote that that kind of view, with but not of Europe, um, went much deeper within British society and it especially resonated with blue-collar workers. Uh, these were people who were told that EU membership would bring a lot of benefits. But when it came to the areas in which they were generally employed, and that would be in industry primarily, 
uh, it was sometimes those areas that suffered, while the UK itself thrived overall as a kind of hub for finance. When you couple that to the financial crisis that the EU hasn't really recovered from, uh, I think it's quite apparent that many Britons who ended up voting leave did so as they saw it, with not just their hearts, but with their heads as well. So what's Europe lost politically from Brexit and what are some of the implications? Well, number one, it has lost a major ally for forces who favor intergovernmentalism within the EU rather than federalism or a federal structure. For many, many years, British uh, policy on this score was that integration should be relatively light, it should be between governments, we don't want a European federation, uh, and found common cause with many former communist countries in Eastern Europe uh, on that notion. And obviously, of course, it is lost. The EU itself has lost a leading net contributor to EU finances. What does the EU do? Well, going back to the idea of widening and deepening, I think it does need to re-examine the issue of uh, enlargement uh, as opposed to the issue of internal consolidation. Uh, and I think you probably are going to see in some shape or form uh, a shift back towards a, a primarily deepening agenda. Europe has tried very hard to uh, sell the idea uh, that it is a community of shared values. And it's done that, I think, quite well on the external level. But I'm not sure really it's done that all that well internally. I'm not sure that that narrative has really bitten, particularly after the global financial crisis. And if you don't win on the values argument, you have to win on the interests argument. And in the kind of rough economic seas the EU is navigating still now, uh, it means that, that both those arguments are, are hard to win. So the EU, I think, does very much need to address notions of legitimacy. Uh, it needs to go back to the very basic question, try and inform its publics about what is the EU for, do a better job of saying why it's better to be in than out, because of course you have nationalistic voices, you have Marine Le Pen circling in France, you have voices in Austria, you have voices in Denmark, you have other places ready to capitalize on that perception of weakness let me shift from politics to security. Have a look at that dimension because that's mainly what I get paid for. Uh, what does Brexit mean for European security and what does it mean for global security? I think there's a very easy answer and the easy answer is not much and quite a lot simultaneously. Um, let me deal with the not much. The UK itself is not physically leaving Europe. It's not actually attaching an outboard motor and motoring off to, the, uh, to somewhere off uh, the coast of the United States. It's still going to be a leading member of NATO. It's still going to be a leading con uh, contributor in European security and defense efforts. So on that broad level, I think not a lot changes. And many in Australia would make that observation, I think, because the UK is over there, far away. Well, it's left the EU in terms of security. Does it really matter? Our eyes are mainly focused on Asia for very good reasons. On another, another level, though, I think it does change the calculation quite a great deal in terms of process of European security and defence policy, uh, in terms of the type of the threat envi of, uh, environment and the types of institutions that can respond to particular security dangers. Overall, um, I think it's quite clear it does make NATO more than ever the premier vehicle for European security affairs. Now, there are many who would write on this topic who had high hopes that the European Union would supplant NATO uh, as a leading defense actor, but I think that the Brexit shows that that's well and truly now on hold. That said, of course, individual EU nations will continue to uh, have their own specific areas of security interest. So if, for instance, you are France, you're going to, going to continue to focus on the southern Mediterranean threat environment. If you're a northern European state, you're going to continue to focus on Arctic maritime trade routes. Um, you're going to worry also about competition over oil and gas in that area, and chiefly competition over oil and gas coming from Russia. Uh, and everybody, of course, within the EU, whether it's Britain or not, uh, is going to continue to worry about the influx of refugees, which is another factor that puts an enlargement agenda, I think, on hold for the time being. Um, for instance, you know, Turkey is not going to get in any time soon. It's questionable whether Turkey even wants to get in now. Uh, and I think one could probably say the same for Ukraine, although the desire for membership in Ukraine is obviously higher. 
So the overall burden of European managing European security now falls very much to NATO, uh, and uh, the EU will play a supporting role. That's why the upcoming July NATO summit in Warsaw is absolutely crucial, uh, because NATO anyway was planning to shift its strategic concept to become a little bit more muscular. Uh, and uh, now with the Brexit, there will be a determination to show that the NATO alliance remains as strong as ever. In other words, it's no longer enough, I think, uh, to NATO, uh, for NATO to be a kind of vehicle that in the old fashioned parlance keeps America in, keeps Germany down and keeps Russia out. Uh, now the narrative has to include that it's keeping Britain in as well. So it might be at the rhetorical level that both NATO and the EU will talk about a sort of holistic security concept. Uh, one of the phrases you often see used is a 360 degree security concept. But in reality, NATO is anyway moving back to a kind of collective defense posture. Some will say that it never really abandoned that collective defense posture, and I have quite a bit of sympathy for that view. Uh, but it will be necessary, I think, to take a strong line within NATO as the main instrument for regional security, um, given that regardless of who is to blame for the various existential threats that the EU faces and NATO faces, they do in fact face existential threats that they need to respond to. That leads me very neatly to my only area of specialization, which is Russia. It's very popular to say that Vladimir Putin is rubbing his hands with glee over Brexit. Uh, and uh, he's rubbing his hands for two main reasons. One, it seems to confirm the Russian narrative that the EU is economically bankrupt and that it's spiritually bankrupt as well. That it's a failed supranational experiment that's uh, doomed to collapse. That's at the sort of broad ideational level. Second, of course, the Brexit does something seemingly quite good for Russia. A bit of an own goal, in fact, from the EU. It removes a strong critic of Russian policy from the EU. Uh, and Putin will doubtless believe he'll get a much better deal on sanctions uh, and Russia's desire for a kind of buffer zone in the so-called near abroad from an EU that doesn't have the Britain in it as opposed to one that does. Now, I think there is some truth in that. Uh, without wanting to overplay the role of material factors, it's hardly coincidental that the UK's tough line on Putin is facilitated by the fact that Britain only imports 6 to 8% of its gas from Gazprom. Whereas if you're Germany and you're at around 40% reliance on Gazprom, uh, you're not in such a, a fortunate position. But I do think we shouldn't overestimate that argument. Uh, with NATO very keen now to prove that uh, while the EU may have been diminished, uh, transatlantic solidarity hasn't been diminished, uh, I think it's going to be high, quite hard for Vladimir Putin to do more than just seek a quicker sanctions exit, as well as pushing this ideational narrative about the failure of Europe, which is, of course, very much yet to transpire. So I don't think we should be uh, overstating the extent that Russia is the big winner out of the Brexit just yet. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, so uh, I will end, uh, I had a few more remarks, but I will end with a quote from someone I think is appropriate, Margaret Thatcher. Um, and I think it's particularly an appropriate way to describe either the current state of Britain's leadership, uh, the nature of the British vote, or even the EU, depending on your perspective. And she said this, it's always important in matters of high politics to know what you don't know. Those who think they know, but are mistaken, and act upon their mistakes are the most dangerous people to have in charge. Thank you very much, folks. All right, uh, thanks, Matt. Um, and again, thanks for everyone turning out. Um, my talk should fit quite nicely with Matt's. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is um, my, I guess, my attempts to muddle through and understand uh, Brexit, how it happened and what it means, as I think many people are also doing. So I'm going to be looking at uncertainty, unpredictability, and what I'm kind of terming disconnections. Um, in terms of why I'm here, um, as Matt said, I work in ethics and philosophy, um, primarily things to do with military ethics and ethics of cyber security. So the question is, and many people have asked me, Adam, you're talking about Brexit. What do you know about Britain or Europe or anything to do with that? Um, what I'd like to say is I, I feel that I'm actually in pretty good company uh, in that any hard questions I can deflect to these two experts. Uh, but more importantly, perhaps, um, 
if we think of an expert as someone who understands the world and understands kind of what the world is doing and where it's going, I'm probably as much of an expert on Brexit as Cameron. Um, he's obviously lost his job as a result of not really understanding what was going on or making mistakes uh, in what he thought was going to happen. I'd also like to think that I'm uh, equivalent to some of the uh, advocates of Brexit who don't seem to have a plan about what's actually happening now. They kind of won and went, oh my God, we won. Ah, what do we do? Um, some of that is indicated, I think, by them walking back promises. Oh, no, no, no. We, we didn't actually mean that £350 million uh, pounds a week would go to the NHS. Um, uh, we meant something else entirely. And that was someone else who said that anyway. Um, there's also the, this uh, phenomenon of the, let's call them Brexiteers and Brogret, people who voted for Brexit, and then the next day went, oh, well, I wouldn't have voted that way if I knew it was going to happen. Um, which I think is, is kind of an interesting thing, uh, and I'll come to a little bit later about maybe some of the decline of understanding of what democracy is. Um, and also, uh, as many of you will probably agree, the smart money was on Remain, um, and we can see this in terms of the stock market uh, going quite crazy after Brexit seemed to occur. Um, and if we think of uh, economics and markets supposedly being indicators of um, collective wisdom and knowledge of the, the crowds and all these sorts of things, then it seems a lot of people got it wrong. Uh, similarly, we can see the collapse with the English pound. I think, I don't know what it's at now, but a few days ago to drop 14% against the, uh, the American dollar. Um, and I think also another a great indicator of people not really knowing what was going to happen was the betting markets. I think even a few days or maybe at least a few weeks before uh, the vote, I think it was seven to one odds. Uh, if you put money down on Brexit, you would have got $7 back for every dollar you put down. So again, a lot of people uh, like myself don't or didn't really seem to understand what was happening or more importantly, what was going to happen. Um, so as I said, this, this kind of leads to this issue or these issues of uncertain, uncertainty, unpredictability and disconnections. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how did people get it wrong with a bit of a focus on polls and predictability. I'm going to raise a little bit of some of the issues I think that were covered um, throughout the campaign uh, to do with immigration and disconnection. Um, I think a, a deep issue of elites and disconnection. Um, I'm going to be looking a little bit at austerity and anger, and maybe that played a bit of a role um, in in what happened in uh, with Brexit. Then, um, at the risk of uh, making the mistake of making a prediction about the future when I'm talking about how hard things are to predict, I'm going to look at maybe some possible outcomes that are going to occur and maybe some of the implications for Australia. So in terms of polls and predictability, uh, many publicly reported polls had remained winning and winning comfortably. Uh, this obviously seems to have been Cameron's belief. I doubt that he would have said, let's go ahead with this if he had have known he was going to lose or that the uh, Remain was going to lose. Um, but to my mind, it shouldn't really surprise us that the polls or at least popular reports on the polls got it wrong. If you look at the uh, US election in 2012, for example, many reports on the polls leading up to the election there had the election to be very, very close. And I don't know if any of you remember this, but uh, footage of Karl Rove refusing to accept evidence of the resounding Obama win. He's like, no, 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 but the polls are this and the polls are that. So there's some problem here, I think, with polls and relying on polls. Similarly, uh, for the UK election in 2015, uh, the polls had the election as very close, knife edge. We're not going to know. It's going to be really close. Maybe there'll be another minority government, etc. And then the Conservatives won com quite comfortably. Um, and I think maybe this could have played a role in Cameron's shock and I guess his his uh, loss that he had possibly given up on polls being accurate because in the previous election polls were okay things are really close but then it turned out to be in his favor so maybe he's gone well maybe the polls are close but hey we can't trust them um, and I think overall this should reduce some of our trust in polls being overly authoritative particularly in their predictions um, and this obviously has a bit of a role for the way in which uh, democracy is played out these days with polls playing a very, very big and important role in how we do democracy. Um, turning now to immigration and disconnection, um, I think it's possibly easy to overlook that there's probably a bunch of, or there, there have been and probably still are, a bunch of angry people in the UK. Um, some of those people, not all of course, uh, have been, well, targeted immigrants as the cause of their problems. Um, and you can actually see, you know, at least there's reports of a rise in racist activities post-Brexit. Um, and I think this shouldn't overlook the fact that there's some, if not many people in the UK who are facing legitimate problems, whether it's social problems, economic problems, etc. cetera. Um, so they've got this assumption and, you know, quite sound going, life is hard. 
For example, I saw a thing yesterday that there's a million people in the UK on waiting lists for council houses. So that's an indication things are hard there. But then the mistake is to blame it on foreigners. Um, so there's a disconnection between current living conditions and the causes of those living conditions. Um, so confusing effect, bad living conditions with causes. You know, immigrants are coming here stealing our jobs and women, the standard kind of uh, xenophobic fear campaign. And that obviously did play a role in the actual campaigning during Brexit. Um, there's a nice quote here that I got from the paper a few days ago, uh, it's from The Guardian, admittedly, so maybe it's a little bit slanted, but it says, uh, as a quote from a person, you know, average person in the street in the UK, who said, and this was before Brexit, we've been left behind, a white middle-aged man told me at a bus stop as I rested in Hemel Hempstead. Those politicians don't care about us. Immigration has ruined this country. And so there's, to me, this point of uh, general disconnection between a bad life and the causes of the bad life. My life sucks and it's that person's fault over there. Um, this then leads us to, I think, a probably a deeper issue about elites and disconnection. So again, we've got a lot of angry people, uh, unhappy people. Um, in part, they're not, or they didn't see the benefits of EU membership, only the problems. And we can look at the, the myths and persistence of myths about what the EU was doing, as I think evidence of this. So these claims about straight bananas, you know, the EU wanted to ban curved bananas or to ban prawn cocktail crisps. crisps. So the EU is going crazy with its bureaucracy and these sorts of things. Those claims are actually absolutely wrong, but they did persist for at least a decade, as far as I can tell. This other claim of £347 million per week, which could be better spent on the NHS. Again, why are we giving all this money to the EU when we're broke, our NHS is broken? Why can't we spend that money on ourselves? And again, this, we can uh, understand this in reference to disconnections. So I believe that people's efforts, such as... Uh, you know, putting money towards things aren't getting their just rewards. Um, and why would people think this? And I think in part, political elites in the UK, or people thought or see or believe that political elites in the UK and Europe are disengaged and disinterested in real people. And I think this uh, represents a deep overall sentiment against political elites or political establishment. Um, and anti we can actually see there's some interesting events occurring now where you have these anti-establishment politicians who are breaking promises the day after Brexit. And I think this confirms this disconnection between politicians saying things to get into power and getting, you know, pursuing their success at all other costs and then going, OK, well, now what do I do with it? Ah, oh, I've got to break my promises. And I think this will only fuel anger and resentment with people in, in the UK. Uh, there's also a, a second issue which a number of people have raised. Um, well, maybe we can exhort, uh, ignore this vote. You know, we'll just either uh, push it out of the way or we'll have another vote or, well, people were stupid and they got it wrong, so, you know, don't worry about it. And this, I think, is a really, really dangerous thing because it ignores democracy and this would confirm the disconnection of political elites in the establishment and would, I think, justify a lot of anger in people. If we go through these democratic processes and they're not recognised as legitimate, then we really have to ask, what is it that we're doing this democracy for? Um, keeping on this notion of anger and austerity, um, there's a, a bit of a line that someone said to me a few days ago, which was, you shouldn't let people who selected Boaty McBoatface as a name for a ship vote. Um, but I think this points to a, a further issue about democracy and problems of democracy. So I think when we think of an issue like Boaty McBoatface, uh, which for those who are unfamiliar, there was a, a public poll on what a particular British boat should be called, and the overwhelming majority of people voted for Boaty McBoatface, which I think is absolutely genius. But with, with these things, there's, there's no skin in the game. It doesn't matter whether you call a boat Boaty McBoatface or the Sir Richard Attenborough or something like that. It doesn't really matter. And I think people might have confused this Brexit vote with something like that, where it doesn't matter which way I vote. You know, some things I'm just expressing an anger or a confusion or a certain belief set, and it doesn't, it won't have any impact on me. Um, so yeah, again, you have this notion of kind of regret where people say, I wouldn't have voted for Brexit if I'd known it would actually occur. Um, but then again, this goes to this notion of angry and unhappy people. And I think one of the causes of people being angry in the UK is austerity arising from the global financial crisis. And they feel betrayed by the elites and establishment. Um, you know, I worked hard, I played hard by the rules and I did everything right and I don't see any of the reward that I deserve. Um, another is a general shift in social norms. And I think this goes to part of the fear about the immigrants. Um, it's a loss of entitlement and exceptional treatment. Here, thinking of middle and working class white males in particular, feeling that their time is passing or has passed. So you can blame it on uh, whether it's immigrants, women, uh, the politically correct elite, etc. 
And so we might actually see evidence of this, um, I guess, loss of a sense of entitlement in the fact that there was a generational difference in voting, where the younger uh, people generally voted to remain, the really old voted to remain, and then this middle-aged voters went for Brexit. Um, and I think one of the important things that we can draw from this is there's a similar set of social factors, I think, driving the US uh, Trump and Sanders supporters. Obviously, Sanders now out of the out of contention, but this underlying feeling that the system hasn't worked and it's the fault of the establishment. We need some people who will come in and change the establishment and you know stick a, a finger in the eye of the politicians without possibly realising what the impact of those decisions are going to be. So what next? Um, is there going to be dissolution or a stronger EU? So what does all of this mean? Um, for the UK, there has been, so far at least the past few days, the expected economic, social and political costs. But then there seems to be this unexpected thing, at least, of the notion of Scotland and Northern Ireland leaving. And so what becomes of the United in the United Kingdom? Um, in terms of globally, there's lots and lots of predictions about what's going to happen, what will happen, what is currently happening. Um, and as I said, one of the hard things at the moment is these predictions. A lot of people seem to be making them without any idea of what's actually happening. Um, for Europe, we can have on one on one hand, for example, the further collapse of the EU. There's obviously one of the big concerns was this would lead to a big breakup of the EU at the end of the EU, etc. But if we if we think of the EU as a good thing and we want to be optimistic and glass half full, perhaps if people see that there's actual costs of exiting, then maybe there's a stronger case uh, for a feeling of the usefulness of EU membership. So I think, again, this notion that, well, there's going to be no cost to us to leave uh, the EU. If other countries see that, they go, actually, this does have impacts to us. We should probably think a bit more about whether we vote this way or not. Um, I obviously have no idea about this, so I can just pontificate on possible outcomes. But I think one of the, the most important things is this uncertainty, unpredictability, and pessimism will play a big role in security and senses of insecurity. So this could then, you know, the, the increase in uh, uncertainty and unpredictability could fuel further insecurity uh, of people, at least, maybe not in the traditional, I guess, political security sense. So as a final uh, set of comments, um, again, I think this uncertainty, unpredictability and disconnection is actually a global phenomena, at least in relation to what, what we could think of as Western democratic institutions. Um, I think that there is a persistent anger and growing anger at a disconnected political class. Um, Australia so far has been sheltered from a strong anger due to a lack of austerity and the social malaise faced by the UK and the US. Um, so I think some people have said to me at least that there's more of an apathy and general disengagement with politicians and politics in Australia than real anger. But then I was thinking about this last night and I was like, oh, but wait a minute, we've had five prime ministers since uh, 2010. So there is something that we also share with the UK in terms of this anger and I think a, a disengagement with politics and an anger at the politicians being disengaged. Um, I think this disconnection, so this is where my predictions uh Again, overlooking just what I said, but I, I do have a couple of predictions that this disconnection will be expressed in an even greater vote for non-major parties in the Australian election on Saturday. Um, and I think also given the rise in racist events in the UK following Brexit, there seems to be a legitimate fear about the impacts of the plebiscite on marriage equality. Some of the concerns about that is that it might stoke further kind of homophobia or, or other unpleasant outcomes. I think also it's probably going to heavily shake or it should at least challenge uh, Turnbull's belief that the plebiscite would easily go his way and silence the social conservative element of the coalition. Um, I think he should be fairly kind of worried about that now. Um, for me, a fantasy outcome of this would be some substantial shift away from focus group and poll-driven politics, given, again, that the, the polls and the, the impact that they have on our political decision-making and the certainty in those things seems to be shaken. I think we should really be... Uh, rethinking the way in which we're doing politics and democracy more generally. And as a final comment, and probably the most important prediction, um, which I think is has really, really big impacts, is I predict that Brexit will be word of the year. So when we look back at the word of the year stuff, people go, aha, Brexit, that was 2016's word of the year. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Alex Rand. I'm from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, at the Shangri-La Dialogue, the French uh, Defence Minister said uh, or intimated that Europe should be more involved in the Indo-Pacific um, and in a recent uh, Peter Jennings article he said that the UK would probably have to step back from its commitments uh, to the region including the five power defence uh, arrangement because it would have less capability, less capacity etc. Um, does anyone have any comments on uh, 
uh, implications of Brexit in terms of the UK's involvement in the Indo-Pacific uh, or the EU's involvement in the UK in the Indo-Pacific? Thank you. Yeah, I might take that one. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I suppose it raises uh, or has an assumption inside it, uh, and that is that the French were serious. Um, well, not just that they were serious, uh, but they had genuine intentions of getting involved in things like phonops in the South China Sea, which they certainly referred to. Um, to what extent is that a realistic goal for French uh, um, uh, power projection capabilities? Um, and also to what extent is it France acting alone or in concert perhaps with the United States um, naval forces, Australian naval forces, with Britain coming along for the ride? Um, I do think there is some truth in the notion that the UK is going to have to take uh, a bit of a step back from uh, Asia. It's interesting that uh, when the US pivoted uh, or rebalanced towards the Asia Pacific, it spurred a whole bunch of secondary pivots. Uh, the EU, of course, said that it wanted to pivot to, uh, to the Asia Pacific, but varying uh, different countries within the EU have varying capacity to do so. Uh, and a pivot, of course, is not just an economic pivot, trade pivot, political pivot, military security pivot as well. Uh, so I, I, I think the jury is still out on the extent to which France will be able to come through with what it has uh, signalled that it might do uh, within the Asia-Pacific, particularly in Southeast Asia and in some of those key maritime trade routes. Uh, I think that it is probably too early to say, with all due respect to Peter Jennings, um, too early to say what uh, the United Kingdom will do. Um, its own capacity, its own naval capacity, has been significantly diminished over the years. And it's only been recently that it's gone back up to the 2% defence spending ceiling. So that has a knock-on effect in terms of capabilities, a lag time, if you like. It'll take a little while before the UK is able to project that type of naval power within the Asia-Pacific on a consistent basis. Uh, so it, it may be a question uh, not so much of intent for the United Kingdom, uh, but of uh, uh, capability. Uh, and also, I think that there is an added imperative to the UK, uh, for the UK to show that it is really committed to first and foremost European security, having having taken this vote. Now, whoever succeeds, uh, Cameron, um, and one suspects it's not likely to be Corbyn, uh, might be someone from within the Labour Party next time there's an election. But one also sees Boris Johnson circling. They are going to have to prove their credentials, reprove their credentials to, uh, to European security. And that means engagement primarily through NATO rather than in the Asia Pacific. NATO as an actor in the Asia Pacific is something that is only vaguely thought about uh, rather than, than actively pursued. Uh, Greg Jarosz, Trend Consulting. Um, EU's been around for decades, hasn't it? Was there not a serious concerted attempt to monitor the aspirations, the tensions, the challenges, the schisms that were occurring within the member states so that the Greek crisis wasn't a surprise, the refugee flow wasn't a surprise. It, it, one gets the impression that it was like, we'll just look at the good side of things, we'll ignore the bad things that we can see happening, and we won't have any scenario game planning, we won't have any plan B, C, D. Everything's going to go according to our plan, and we'll almost ignore these cracks appearing right in front of us? Uh, it's a good question. EU hubris. Uh, I might pass that to Emery. Thanks, Matt, and thanks for the question. Um, I know why you ask this one, I think, um, on the back of the Brexit vote, and certainly I think, in a way, the responses from the EU leaders could have been different in the run-up to the referendum vote. Um, the referendum vote and then all these other issues that you raise as well, there is a tendency, I suppose, not to want to focus on those negative aspects. So the referendum is an interesting case because in a lot of ways, EU leaders seem to go with the notion that if if we pretended that the, that the forthcoming vote wasn't taking place, then it wouldn't occur in a way that was detrimental to the EU. That's clearly not enough. It's, it's not enough to deal with this kind of crisis. And um, as for the other crises that you refer to, uh, the financial crisis, migration crisis, 
You know, EU leadership is uh, simply trying to deal with these issues in the same way that a national government would and, and tries to do. And often the problems cross borders. So the EU is an appropriate place for the things to be dealt with, but that doesn't mean that the, the decision-making processes around those are easy. I mean, you've got to get 28 member states on board, uh, clearly. 27 now, thank you, Matt. <laughs> But 28, um, you know, it's decision making is slow. The institutional processes can be slow, and that's a major criticism that has been, has been levelled at the EU over many years. Now, that's not to say it's totally ineffective in these areas, but it is a different decision making process. Um, so, yeah, I, I take your point entirely, and I think, unfortunately, on the, on the case of the British referendum, the approach of simply pretending the problem wasn't there was not enough in this instance. Yeah, uh, look, I, and I'll just finish with this um, statement. I think Cameron did indicate that the UK being in, Brit in the European Union did allow it to have input in policy decision-making. But he then sort of left it at that and as if to say, well, yeah, we have an input. And I guess the next question would have been, and what was the outcome? Was the input valuable? Was it taken note of? Was it acted on? Or was it simply a matter of, we'll continue to provide input but the outcomes won't be what we would like to see. And therefore, it's a talk fest. Well, if I could follow up. Uh, look, it's not a talk fest in the sense that um, the EU is a really interesting case of an international organisation where decisions are taken that sometimes affect member states and those member states may not have wished to sign up to that decision. But the fact is that um, that in each case the UK was involved in the decision-making process. So the whole idea that you defer blame for things to Brussels as though Brussels has imposed this upon you and you are some sort of passive uh, consumer of policy coming from the European Union, it, it's blatantly false um, uh, because that's not how the thing works. Um, having said that, I, I, I take your point about um, the British government not being clear about their specific role that they were going to have inside the European Union going forward. And this is, uh, I know it's floating around social media at the moment, this is the Sir Humphrey Appleby question about Britain and the European Union. Um, that idea that if um, the Brits are in the European Union that they can shape um, the nature and the pace of integration, whereas if they're outside of European integration, that they somehow then simply have to be a consumer of what happens inside the EU and yet will still be affected by that without participating in the decision making. So Sir so Humphrey, you'll recall from that particular episode, says that the Brits had to be in the European Union so that they could make a pig's breakfast of the whole thing. Um, now, um, the question that gets interesting about this um, aspect of the debate is the extent to which the UK was an active participant in reform of EU institutions. Now, I think many analysts would agree that that needs to occur across a range of areas, economically and politically, um, and whether or not the UK was making any, any headway in that is a separate question. Patrick Sorry, Joe Brockman, Patrick. National Security College. I was asking from a public policy perspective about maintaining public consent to a social licence. So if you view the EU as a social licence by the communities, from a public policy perspective, we have a tendency to say, that argument has now been won, let's move on to the next issue at hand, and we leave behind the maintenance of public consent. So how can we build public policy that maintains the public consent to a licence that has been granted to government? using this example of what happens when we don't maintain public consent. Um, I might let Anne-Marie think about that for a little while while I offer a little bit of, uh, um, sort of my own observation about the nature of consent. Well, of course, that consent in part was manufactured uh, and in part because it wasn't really put to popular votes. Uh, referendums are the things that, that the EU has shied away from very much. There's another interesting thing about that, that nature of consent within uh, British society particularly, where those dissenting voices that previously could be used for external purposes now become internal problems, public policy problems for the United Kingdom. And I'm speaking particularly about UKIP. So UKIP was very much an external, something that the UK could externalise and say, well, here's the protest vote against the EU, we'll send them off to the European Parliament. They can rant and rave uh, about Brussels as much as they like. They can bring up the yes uh, minister, yes prime minister arguments about the British sausage being redesignated the high fat emulsified offal tube uh, and how ridiculous that is. 
Um, but now that becomes an internal problem for the British polity. Now, reactions to, to, to the, the creation of that, uh, or recreating consent, uh, is, is a problem not just for the European Union now, but creating consent is a problem for uh, the British government as to what role it takes outside the EU and how close it gets to the EU. My worry is, of course, that UKIP, having played that role in the EU, now becomes uh, uh, a, plays a similar role within British society. So in other words, the UKIP, in a way, is the ultimate spoiler party. So it spoils on European Union. It spoils uh, on the vote to exit. Uh, and of course, those who, who made the argument for exit, um, the, the more moderate ones, are now saying, well, UKIP has now done its job. Thank you very much. We'll now leave that. But UKIP also played a spoiling role in splitting the Tories. It's now playing a role in splitting the left. Uh, are we going to see those types of voices which will not consent no matter what to the types of policy constructions that come out of individual nation states or a supranational institution? Are we going to see that play a further spoiling, or spoiling role and damaging role in the future? Quite possibly. Anne-Marie? Thank you, and thanks, Patrick, for the question. Uh, look, I think that, uh, just by way of a bit of background, the idea that the European Union has had a democratic deficit um, has been floating around since the early 1990s. And in part, it's because it's a unique and uh, rather peculiar set of institutions. So it gains its legitimacy through two, um, two ways, primarily. One is that there's a directly elected European Parliament. So to the extent that they choose to do so, citizens can elect their own members of the European Parliament. And then the other way that democracy works through the EU, of course, is that national governments go and represent the interests of their electorate in, in Brussels. So there's kind of two sources of legitimacy there, and it's, I think, easy for um, that legitimacy to be, to be somehow uh, lost or underestimated. And it is difficult for um, Joe Public to understand that. Um, I just would return to one of the points I briefly made in my presentation, which was that the EU, unfortunately, has not been well understood. And, um, and as part of what you're referring to as a social contract, voters need to understand what this thing is and what it does and what benefits there are and uh, potentially that it may contribute to peace, stability, prosperity and so on and so forth. Now, if that is lost in the debate, and it clearly was lost in the campaign that we just saw, um, you know, unfortunately, it, it underlines the, the, the great need for further education about the likes of the EU <clears throat> and some of that responsibility falls to national governments. So there wasn't a lot of the UK government going around saying uh, this, that and the other has occurred as part of the European integration process, which we signed up to and which we participated in the decision making for. That, that really wasn't heard terribly often and more could have been made of it. Um, but uh, I return to my plea for more education. Uh, Adam, do you want to channel Gramsci and do some coercion and consent or, yeah? Maybe not channeling Gramsci, but um, for me, one of the, the interesting things and looking at this notion of um, legitimacy and, and consent and again, you know, the, the role of democracy, um, I think one of the, I don't know how, how this relates or not, but uh, there's, I don't know if people have been following, uh, last week there was a renewed discussion in Texas where Texas leaves the US. Um, I saw a thing today, someone proposing uh, either Queensland or Northern Queensland leaving Australia, oh, um, <laughs> which possibly doesn't seem such a bad thing. No, um, I don't mean that at all. Um, but the point there about this, this sense, I, I think this goes back to the sense of disconnection and uh, the idea, ab whether it's flawed, whether it's um, accurate or not, is kind of beside the point. But the idea that a lot of people have that there is this elite bunch of people who are making a whole bunch of decisions about me that impact me negatively and I have no say in it whatsoever. So the sense of um, illegitimacy comes from the sense of alienation um, that I think many people do feel about politics in general and a, something along the lines of a, a professional class of, uh, of politicians rather than them actually being people, they've been politicians their entire lives, they don't know what it's like to be a person, etc. Um, how to respond to that, I think um, part of it is the education actually showing, no, 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 wait, this is good for us, this is good for you, here are the good things that we're doing, here are the good outcomes of that. One of the really hard things about that is if a government is sitting there telling you how awesome things are, 
it's kind of like a, um, a parent telling a child, oh, but look, you know, everything's cool, eat your greens and they'll be awesome. Um, you're going to be very sceptical about that and maybe a little bit unsure whether the, the government's just propagandizing, uh, propagandizing to you or not. So I think it's a really hard thing to demonstrate the utility and usefulness of these cooperative enterprises. Um, but I don't know, there's something about this, this connection that I think is, I don't know if it's a novel thing, but it does seem to be playing a big role in politics and I guess senses of legitimacy these days. David Goyne, uh, I work at the Department of Defence, but I guess my questions really reflect my own views, not theirs, uh, if they have a view. Uh, okay, look, I think some of the points that Adam just raised are part of the cause of dis disillusionment, but I suspect the root cause of it is the disappearance of working class jobs. And I don't see that being anything but a runaway train. In fact, it's probably going to reach into middle class jobs very soon. So as work disappears under an onslaught of automation, machine intelligence, whatever, we've probably seen a very mild form of protest at that. What is the future for this for internal security of states as this comes to play out, and not just in Britain, not just in Europe, but globally? Yep. Um, so at the risk of exposing myself as a dirty, stinking lefty, um, one of the things that has often bothered and frustrated me about discussions of new technologies is, oh, we've got these great new technologies and these are fantastic and everything will be safer because we won't have as many people working on these things and um, it'll be better and cheaper because you don't have people working is it overlooks, okay, this is going to cause unemployment and then this leads to insecurity and stability and these sorts of things. So I think if we're like one of the, the fantasy or uh, let's say desirable elements that has to go hand in hand with these sorts of disruptions is having some form of uh, social safety net, et cetera, et cetera, so that people who either lose their jobs or have downgrades in the amount of time that they're employed and the, the following money that comes from that, that there is support for them in that regard. Um, and it is quite a, I think it is going to be uh, an increasingly problematic issue as we see the rise of automation robots and these sorts of things. and even beyond uh, the standard challenges to what we'd consider kind of blue collar jobs or working class jobs, there's now a whole bunch of robots or um, computer bots that can write newspaper articles, uh, can probably write academic papers as good if not better than we can do. Um, so th this challenge isn't going to be something that's simply faced by you know, what we consider the standard industrial type jobs. Um, how we face that as a society generally, I think we, we do need to do something about that. The hard part is their slow, um, almost kind of generational issues that need to be solved in our current kind of democratic politics is geared at election cycles or now prime minister cycles, where you know might be two years before you actually are held accountable for what you're doing. Um, and this, I think, creates a real big problem because we're going to have these long-standing, big generational issues that aren't going to be probably dealt with effectively by the way in which we're doing dem Democrats and politics, uh, democracy and politics at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I won't comment on uh, implications for internal security of states, but just to, uh, to add a comment there, I think the Brexit vote that we saw on Friday is in some ways symptomatic of a gap that we're now seeing between what governments seek to do in terms of economic integration and free trade agreements, for example, for, um, for their states and then what people think their political borders ought to be. So another area that is increasingly politicised recently is in relation to the big trade agreements, mega regionals for example, the likes of the proposed free trade agreement between the United States and the European Union. We're seeing those areas increasingly politicised, increasingly controversial. We're seeing political protest on trade issues which you know, even 20 years ago, people probably wouldn't have bothered. Um, but what we're seeing is where governments seek economic integration of a certain kind that goes well beyond borders and starts to impact on things like regulatory politics, citizens are suddenly getting much more animated about that stuff. Now, the EU is, as we know, the most advanced case of economic integration around the place. And I think that we're seeing something interesting there in terms of, you know, a backlash against that, but it's not limited to the European Union, of course. This goes well beyond that, and the big free trade agreements are somewhere else that you could look to as an example of 
exactly the kind of thing you're referring to, disenfranchisement of uh, working class perhaps and then a response from voters that is negative about those economic arrangements. So I think governments have to think very carefully now about how they're going to start to market some of that stuff internally if they're going to handle the politics of it. Benjamin Baker from the Royal Norwegian Embassy. Uh, I have a question for all three of you. Um, I'd like to perhaps go a little bit to the hypothetical. You know, as you've seen, there's been a lot of talk of, of INDREF2, the Scottish second Scottish independence vote. I would like you to, if you can, uh, speculate a bit how you think that that would affect the future of the United Kingdom if that actually came to pass, uh, both from a political perspective, how it could affect the EU further, and also what the security implications, strategic implications could be for the United Kingdom, uh, which would no longer be the United Kingdom. That's it. Uh, well, uh, let me take the security implications or immediately immediate strategic implications. If that happened, then the UK has to find a new home for its uh, nuclear submarines uh, because, of course, they're based in Faslane in Scotland. And uh, more than that, it actually has to become more than simply a maritime defence actor because it will see itself shifting to a much more maritime defence posture as a result of the Brexit. It will need to within NATO. Uh, and, uh, and Britain uh, would have to have a northern border. Uh, and that, regardless of how friendly the Scots were, there would be no assumption that they'd be coming over the hill waving axes. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, that takes state resources. Uh, even having a border has resources, uh, takes resources. So it, it's another impost or another cost. Um, were you to hold a referendum now with the amount of resentment and the amount of outrage that the Scottish uh, feel uh, about what, what's been done to them uh, by, by the British, you know, the English, uh, so, uh, yeah, by the English, uh, then you probably would have a vote in favour. I wouldn't necessarily speculate, want to speculate that those numbers would hold up, however, because it is a very big call. Scotland only just recently voted very narrowly to stay in um, and uh, at a time when seas were much calmer. Uh, with seas rougher, I think that there, it would be hard to mount an out case because it would take six to 12, well, it would take 12 months, 12 to 18 months, frankly, to gear up. Uh, and uh, there would be an awful lot of pressure and an awful lot of inducements put on the Scots to remain in. But uh, I'm not an expert so much on Scottish politics, so I'll defer to, to Anne-Marie. Uh, neither am I, Matt, but uh, I've loads of Scottish ancestry, so I'll keep my views about Scottish independence to myself. Uh, just to add, really, that, um, as I said previously, the um, the extent to which the UK is now disunited is a serious problem for the uh, for the government, uh, and it adds to our uncertainty about the whole scenario. Because if there is, for example, to be a further Scottish referendum again, this takes time, and while all of this plays out, uh, the UK and the EU are not then involved in the negotiations that need to take place in order to arrive at satisfactory post-Brexit arrangements. And, you know, if I'm too selfishly, I suppose, but take the Australian view, um, it would be better for third countries if those negotiations were swift and smooth um, and if whatever arrangements are to be in place can please be put in place so that we can all get on with it. Um, so um, I'm by no stretch a, a, an expert on internal UK politics, but we're looking at a very seriously divided country economically, geographically, politically, and the major parties pulling themselves to, to pieces. So it's not pretty. I'm conscious of the time, folks, so what we might do is now run three questions together. So we will take George, we'll take this gentleman just behind George, and we'll take Kyle. Um, so mine's going closer to home. I mean, it's been very nice to talk about Europe, but maybe we should come back a little bit to what does it mean for us. So, um, and, and a few takes on that. I mean, um, the next couple of years, um, and perhaps three given the delay and actually pulling a trigger obviously going to be locally focused, but the world doesn't stop for us. The challenges, um, maritime trade and other don't stop for us. Um, so I guess the question is thinking of the, um, our diplomatic efforts, the recently announced European Australian Leadership Dialogue and the challenges of life generally, what might we be doing during that period when um, the last thing Europe and the UK might want to be doing really is focusing on the Asia-Pacific and the Indo-Pacific. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Vipur. I'm a master's student at CAP School. 
so the narrow margin of the break exit referendum does it offer lessons for policy makers that the future referendums on such important subjects which have far reaching implications should be decided by a two third majority or 50 more than 51% majority so that it constitute a uh, decisive mandate thanks matt um well just a very brief comment you you said that it was popular to see Putin is rubbing his hands. I would put it to you, there's good reason for it to be popular. Um, a whole series of Russian politicians have expressed jubilation. Um, the Kremlin's business ombudsman, I'll just quote him, said that Brexit will separate Europe from the Anglo-Saxons, that is, from the United States. This is not the independence of Britain and Europe, but of Europe from the United States. We are not far from a united Eurasia in 10 years. And only two years ago, Sergei Karavokanov in Sweden predicted the end of Europe within 10 years. So there are grounds for seeing it as popular, but the, the point I wanted to make is that, um, of course, this has implications, and you might wish to comment on the United Nations, where a much reduced England can hardly be expected to retain its UN Security Council seat and certain Russian diplomats have already put the case that in Moscow's view, uh, Germany has a much stronger claim to be a member of the UN Security Council than Great Britain has. So you may wish to comment. Excellent. Shall we uh, start with what does it mean for Australia? Amory, it's you. <clears throat> Yes, thanks, George, for the question. Uh, one of the immediate practical implications for Australia is that we have a prospective EU-Australia trade agreement uh, that has is being looked at in Brussels and Canberra. Uh, it is um, the case that everybody has come out saying that this will not be interrupted by the possible Brexit. But the truth is that instead of Australia negotiating with the EU-28, the EU-27 and the UK will now be negotiating with each other. So we will be reverting to Australia's usual position in proceedings, which is trying to get everybody's attention. Um, th this is difficult for Australia, and, um, and it's not a great development. So it's at best a, a delay, at worst it's a serious disruption. Um, you know, Brexit is a nuisance from the point of view of Australian policymakers, I would have thought. So, um, so if it is to be, then it, then it would be better if they got on with it. Um, as to... Um, do you want me to go through the questions, Matt, or we deal with Australian implications in full? Good. Okay, I'll stop there. Right. Well, we'll do, do Adam on what is legitimate. So I was thinking about this this question uh, this morning, actually. Uh, not that I have foresight and you're going to ask it, but this issue of, okay, it's 52% uh, were in favour, 48% were against it. And to me, uh, my brain was going, that's not much of a majority. That's a pretty tiny amount. But then I think the actual numbers were a million voting in or a million more voting in favour of leaving than remaining. So in that sense, when you look at the actual numbers, a million people is a pretty substantial majority in that regard. Um, in terms of whether people should be thinking about referendums having something like a two-thirds majority or 60% or these sorts of things, um, some part of that seems to make sense because if you're, in theory, if you're having a referendum, it should be something about something quite serious. It should be something that we take quite seriously and involve ourselves in quite seriously. One of the counter arguments against having like a higher uh, majority necessary for, for any referendum to be successful is it maintains the status quo. It's a, um, you know, it's a structural incentive to maintain the things the way that they are. I think in Australia we've had three successful referendum from memory and uh, was it like someone, uh, maybe I think it's like 57 in total, maybe I'm getting that figure wrong, but the vast majority of Australian referenda have been um, to maintain the status quo in part because of this uh, majority issue. So when we look at uh, the case of Brexit and for those of us who seem to think it was a pretty silly idea for so many people to vote to leave, then the inclination is, well, maybe they should have had a higher majority needed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then, um, you know, if you have a, uh, say, a plebiscite on uh, marriage equality or if we would have a referendum on marriage equality and we were to have, say, a 60% majority or 60, 66% majority in, or a majority of states all voting in favour, then that would be a much harder referendum to win. And so some part of me would, would think, well, that's actually a bad way of doing it. We want it so that it actually gets through. Um, so I, 
I don't think that there's any good answer to that, but the, yeah, it, it's complicated in terms of maintaining status quo versus change. Russia. Yes, and Russia. Well, uh, look, let me deal with the UN um, and, uh, and Britain's seat in, in the UN Security Council. Um, look, uh, I, I don't mean to be flippant, but just you try and take Britain's seat away from it. I mean, it has to voluntarily give it up. That's not going to happen. Um, in terms of broader Russian narratives, and Carl knows this better, from me better than me because he's just returned uh, from a mission to Moscow. Uh, so he's, he, he knows the, uh, the mood on the ground uh, in Russia. Um, but on Putin's jubilation, uh, I've been fairly uh, upbeat so far, uh, in, in this presentation at least, uh, about the future of European security. Let me now be downbeat with, uh, with Adam uh, having outed himself as a, a rabid lefty. I'll out myself as a, a realist. Um, and uh, uh, yesterday I wrote something uh, for the Lowy uh, interpreter on Russian propaganda. Uh, in, in which I referred to uh, an American political scientist called Randall Schweller, uh, who made a, a very interesting, published a very interesting article about eight years or so ago, in which he talked about global ennui uh, as a result of the different sources of information that spread around the world. Now, immediately after the Cold War, there was one narrative in town, and that was Western democratic universalism, and uh, woe betide anyone who argued against that. Now there are new narratives, lots of new narratives, uh, and one of those narratives is about the failure of the liberal project uh, and the end of the liberal order, the end of the rules-based order that we are used to, and Brexit as proof of that. Is this the case? Um, well, uh, I think it's precipitate to say that it is the end of the liberal order, uh, but there are some discouraging signs, uh, and, uh, and Brexit is certainly one of those. More than that, uh, it's not just the Russians that see this. It is increasingly the Americans that are starting to think about a lack of European unity or a diminishment in European capacity to be, uh, um, to be well, frankly, to be able, in the first instance, to burden share with the United States, because that's what the United States wants, first and foremost, burden sharing from traditional allies. But more than that, as a long-term security policy, global security actor going forward, uh, the US worry is that the EU or various European states will be less able or more importantly, less willing due to the reimposition of national agendas on foreign security policy and moving away from some of those hard and fast values principles that the EU has espoused, more towards an interest-based uh, uh, approach, um, less able to, to try and solve some of the world's problems um, as, a, as a global security concern, whereas there was much enthusiasm for this within the EU oh, uh, about three or four years ago, um, as recently as that. So it's not just the Russians that, that, that foresee weakness, uh, it's the Americans too. What does that mean? What are the implications? Um, well, I like this notion of, of global ennui because it means that the marketplace for ideas is very, very crowded now. And navigating that marketplace is going to be difficult. And it is something that cuts across national boundaries. It's not just states that are responding to different narratives out there, it's publics. And publics see that there are different points of view, whether they are truthful, whether they are partially truthful, or that whether they are fundamentally out and out lies, as you know, many of the Leave campaign said in uh, put forward in the in the uh, the referendum, uh, but more globally as well, uh, there are these various cornucopia of ideas circulating, and that makes people mistrustful, and it makes people apathetic, uh, and I don't think it does reinforce this sense of ennui, and the sense of ennui will affect afflict the West first, uh, and uh, before it, it spreads to others. So that's my gloomy conclusion. Uh, just for you, Kyle. <laughs> and on that very happy note, uh, we, are, we are out of time by a couple of minutes. Uh, so look, let me thank you very much for all your questions and for coming. We hope it's been illuminating for you uh, and enlightening. Uh, we would like to uh, perhaps follow up uh, with similar events uh, if there's enough uh, desire for it. And certainly, uh, I know we'd like to, uh, to cooperate more with, uh, with the Centre for European Studies. Uh, I think this is the first step towards doing, doing uh, a few more things. Let me thank Anne-Marie very much, uh, and uh, also Adam, uh, and thank you for your attendance. Many thanks, and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you.